we'll probably be spending um, most of our time there, and then we'll be hitting a couple other places. But we looked at, Allison mentioned, uh, margin, and the first week was scheduling margin, and then we looked at financial margin. I heard, I've heard so many people talking about just the timeliness of this particular series, and I love it when uh, we're, we're in unison with what God's heart is wanting to do among us, and, and I love to hear those, those things happening. Today we're talking about a, a type of margin that you may not have thought of, but we're calling it moral margin, moral margin. As you're turning to James chapter 1, I just want to ask a couple of questions, or just actually one question, but before you answer, I want you to think about it, okay? Just kind of sit with the question for a second, but how many of you know someone and don't raise your hand, but how many of you know someone whose life has been wrecked by sexual sin at some point in their life? For example, maybe you know someone who struggled with pornography and it kind of overtook their life and eventually it cost them and maybe even cost them their marriage. Or maybe you know someone that had sex before they were married and they got pregnant and maybe they panicked and they had an abortion and now they live with that guilt and maybe part of that situation was, hey, they chose, or they had to choose, am I going to marry some jerk that I don't love, or am I going to uh, abort the child, and it, it was just tough. Or maybe you know someone who's been haunted by a sexual disease after a one-night stand. Maybe, maybe you know someone who was promiscuous before they got married, in and out of relationships, and then when they got married, that just brought all of that baggage into their marriage, and now there's this constant fear of comparison and expectations and all kinds of of tension sexually in their marriage. Or, or maybe you know someone who had an affair, and of course they didn't plan on it, but one day they woke up and suddenly, suddenly they realized that their own marriage was in tremendous jeopardy because of sexual sin. And I want you to think about it. I'll ask you again, how many of you know someone whose life has been wrecked by sexual sin? Uh, virtually everybody. It's interesting to me that when you think about it, I don't know anyone who sets out and says, you know what, one of my five, one of my goals in my five-year plan is I, I want to ha have an affair. That, that's just one of my goals. I, I don't know anybody who says, you know, I'm planning on maybe one day becoming addicted to pornography so that the images and the fantasies on a screen or the fantasies in a book can consume and pollute my mind. I don't know anybody who does that. I don't know anyone who says, this is the year I'm going to get a sexual transmitted disease. I, I, don't, I haven't met a person who says, if I play my cards right, I'll bet I can fall into some type of sexual thing that costs me my job, or better yet, it takes out my marriage or it causes my children to lose respect for me. I, I don't know anyone who thinks like that, and yet... It happens all the time, just all the time. And here's what I've noticed, and maybe you have too. The most common thing that people say on the other side of a sexual tragedy is, I never thought it would happen to me. Not, not to me. And, and the thing that all of these people have in common at some point in their life, they lacked moral margin. Moral margin, and you may be asking, what is, what is moral margin? Moral margin is putting distance between you and temptation. It's the distance between you and temptation, kind of like a moat around a castle. It's the space between you and tragedy. In fact, James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15, has some great verses on temptation. Here's what James said. The Bible says, when tempted... No one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desire, out of our own sin nature that's constantly pulling us off track, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and what? Would you say this word aloud with me? He's dragged away and what? Enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. The Bible says that we are dragged away and enticed. And this word enticed, I, I looked it up, and here's what it means. It means entrapped. It means to allure, to entice, or very literally to hook. It's a fisherman's term. 
to put a bait on a hook and to catch your fish with this hook. So your spiritual enemy is trying to hook you into something allowing sin to be born. And because sin, he knows, when it's full grown according to this text, it doesn't lead to life, but rather it leads to death. When we're dragged away, when we're enticed, entrapped, I never thought it would happen to me. And what's interesting, especially when it comes to sexual sin, is people often ask the wrong question. Over and over again, we ask things like, well, how far can I go? How far is too far? In other words, I know that there's a line out there somewhere that I shouldn't cross, but I want to know where it is because I want to get, and here's the mindset, I want to get right up to that line. How far is too far? Which just seems a little messed up to me because I can't think of very many areas in my life where I would be asking that same question, like just how close can I get to this dangerous thing that might actually hurt me? For example, I don't know anyone in their right mind who puts three bullets in a revolver and then spins that and just wonders how many times can I pull back the hammer before I'm hurt? Nobody, nobody, nobody does that. I don't know anybody besides the idiots on YouTube who will put their heads in an, allig an alligator's mouth and, and just wonder how long can I keep that there before he chomps down on my head. Like, like no sane person does that. In Florida, we've got, we've got lots of poisonous snakes. And I can, honest, I can promise you that I've never gone up to a, a, a poisonous snake and said, hey there, Mr. Coral Snake, how close can I put my hand to your face before you bite me and send me to the hospital? We don't do that. And yet, for some reason, when it comes to sexual temptation, people want to know how close can I get? How far is too far? How, how close can I get before I get hurt? Look with me. Uh, at 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Should be there on the screen. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. I want to look at verses 18 through 20. And you'll notice that the first word in this text is what? Can we say it aloud? One, two, three. Flee. flee. The Bible says flee. It doesn't say flirt. right? It doesn't say get close to, but rather flee sexual immorality. Run away. Escape. Get out while you still can. Put some distance, some margin between you and temptation. It's worth noting that the Bible in other areas does not talk about fleeing sin. It doesn't say flee overeating or, or flee gossips. It says flee sexual immorality. Run. Don't ask yourself, how close can I get? Flee. So the wise person is going to put significant margin between themselves and sexual temptation. And, and you may be asking yourself, as some of you have, uh, have asked me, why, Josh, are you zeroing in on sexual temptation when there's so many other sins that affect our life? And the reason is because of how devastating and prolific this particular sin is in our culture. When we look at the stats, there is nothing else that even compares. This is the thing that is taking so many people out. And the scriptures make it clear there's a real difference between, between sexual sin and all others. Notice with me, verse 18. It tells us this, all other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. His own body. And you might say, well, I thought all sins were the same. No, no. You would, you would be wrong. They're not all the same. And that, that could use some clarification. Yes, all sins separate us from God, but all sins are not the same. Just consider the consequences. For example, if, if you tell a little white lie, it may not cost you anything. If you uh, speed and you get a ticket, it may cost you a couple hundred bucks, but that's about it. If you gossip all the time, it may cost you some friendships. But if you sin sexually, well, that could cost you your job. That could cost you your marriage. That could cost you, uh, that could cost your kids growing up without a mom or a dad. It could even cost you your life via sexual 
disease, it could definitely cost you self-esteem. It could cost you your reputation. One bad decision sexually could cost you your entire life. All other sins, the Bible says, they're outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against his own body. And the scripture goes on in verses 19 and 20. The Bible tells us, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? The Bible says, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. And culture tells you, no, 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 it's, it's your body. You do what you want with it. It's a lie. It's a lie. If you belong to Christ, you can't do whatever you want with your body. Your body is not your own. You belong to God. You've been bought with a price. And then get this, God says that your body is actually a house for God and that we are to honor God with our bodies. Now the problem is that culture is going to tempt you and I in so many ways to fall into sexual immorality. It's gonna tempt us even in ways that we might say, well, is that even wrong? Is, is that even wrong? I mean, everybody else is doing it. What's the big deal? Why do I need margin between me and the fun stuff? I mean, isn't that kind of like the goal? Isn't that the fun in life, the fun stuff? Isn't that the goal? I mean, isn't that what we're supposed to do? Why do I need margin? Well, the truth is that this particular sin is different. It sticks with you. It's painful, it's emotional, and it's deeply spiritual. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3, it gives us this warning. Paul said, but among you... There must not even be what? There must not even be a hint of sexual immorality. I want us to think about that for a second. There must not even be a hint. Not even, not even a hint. See, the challenge is that the world we live in has standards that are incredibly, incredibly low when it comes to our sex lives. In the Bible, God's standards are extremely high. So we might think, well, hey, I'm at least better than most people. I, I'm better than most of the world. But God says not even a hint of sexual immorality. And, and so let me give us a couple examples of things that most people would probably say, hey, well, it's not really that big of a deal. If you are doing blank, whatever that is, you're not really crossing the line. But I challenge us to think of this from God's perspective. And if God is going to say uh, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality, and I, I looked this up, sexual immorality, the specific word is the same word for pornea, which is where we get our word pornography, which literally means anything that causes arousal outside of marriage. That, that, that covers a whole lot. Anything that causes arousal outside of marriage. And God says there shouldn't even be a hint of that. So, so let me just ask you this question. You can just nod or think about this. If that is truly God's standard, and if we know God loves us, we know that he wants what's best for us, and we know he's saying there shouldn't even be a hint of this in your life, ask yourself, if someone dresses inappropriately, in a seductive way, causing others to look on and wowzers, you know, and, and lust, is that a hint of sexuality in God's economy, in his economy? What if you're dating someone and we're not going all the way, but what we do, we just do everything but, and, and we all know what everything but is, it's exactly what it is, everything but is everything but. We're not going all the way. Well, think about this. In God's eyes, in his economy, is that a hint of sexual immorality? And yet in today's culture, by today's standards, you would be a halo-wearing angel if you lived by those standards, everything but. How about this? Do you think that reading a cosmo cosmopolitan magazine that says five ways to drive your boyfriend wild in bed, do you think that to God... 
That might be a hint. But in our world, it's considered perfectly normal. In fact, we put those magazines uh, at the grocery stores right there down where our five-year-olds can see them on the way out. It's perfectly normal. And the question the church has to ask is, why is that normal? Because we know, you know what else is normal about sex in our culture is pain. It's shame and regret. That's, that's normal. Guilt and insecurity and comparison, that's normal. Fear and lust and divorce, it's normal. And so we ask ourselves, why is that normal? Because there's a line of what is right and wrong. And when it comes to sexual sin and sexual temptation, our culture has drawn that line in the wrong place. The line, it's buttoned right up against the very thing that most people would say, well, that's obviously wrong and a fair. That's obviously wrong. But I would argue that there are an infinite number of lines, safety lines, that our society just naturally crosses all the time without ever realizing that they are putting themselves in harm's way. They're playing with a poisonous snake. They're playing with a loaded gun, and it's considered normal. And so what I'm going to suggest over these next few moments, you're going to be thinking to yourself, probably, hey, that is weird, Josh. You're like, you, you are taking this too far. That is not normal. And you're right, it's not normal. But we're not aiming for normal. Normal isn't working. Normal is, is filled with hurt. Normal is filled with futures of divided marriages and children coming up in divided homes. So let me just give you a shocking stat I read this week, up to 65% of men and up to 55% of women will commit adultery by the age of 40. 65% of men, up to, and up to 55% of women will commit adultery by the age of 40. And when you combine those numbers together, that means somewhere in the neighborhood of 80% of marriages will be affected. That's our normal. That's our court cultures normal. And you, we, we ask ourselves, why is that normal? It's normal because we have no moral margin. Society has decided what's acceptable, and we all just follow right along as though they're right. Like, well, if, if everybody's doing it, I might as well do it. And we've removed all the safety that comes with margin, crossing line after line, making decisions that are unquestionably destructive. And here's how we tend to get there. We think, we think things like this. Is it wrong to enjoy being with someone of the opposite, opposite sex? Well, well no. Like the line of adultery is way, way over there. So I'm, I'm safe, you know, talking to somebody of the opposite sex. That's, that's not really wrong. Is it wrong to share personal stories with somebody from the opposite sex? You know. I, my wife is really struggling with this. Or, you know, my husband, he, he really irritates me in this way. Is that wrong? Well, well, no, of course not, because the line for sexual affairs is way, way over there, so, so it isn't wrong. Is it wrong to anticipate time with that person? Yeah, you know, I, I really can't wait to be with them and spend a little time with them. Well, that's not wrong. It, that's not wrong because, I mean, we're not committing adultery, and adultery is way, way over there. And then, then we think, well, okay, is it wrong to flirt with someone who's not my spouse? You know, maybe little looks, little comments, little notes, a gift here and there. It, it can't be wrong to have an emotional connection, can it? Well, you know, well, it's probably not right, but it's not adultery, right? It's not, adultery is way, way over there. And then we're asking the question, well, is it wrong to share my feelings with them about how I feel about them? You know, I, honestly, I'm attracted to you. I just kind of, I kind of am. And that's just really what my heart is telling me. I got to go with my heart on this. And can that be wrong? Can it be wrong? And we're right on the precipice. We've walked cross, 
We've passed all these lines and we're playing with a loaded gun. We've got our head in the mouth of the alligator. We're saying here, snakey, 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 and I never thought it would happen to me. Not to me. See, moral margin is the distance between us and temptation. It's the moat around the castle that protects us from tragedy. So over these, few next, over these next few minutes, I want to offer some better places that you and I can draw some lines to create margin in an effort to preserve what God wants for us, in an effort to do what he, he wants us to do and to be who he wants us to be. And admittedly, these suggestions are not normal. I'll admit it, but we're not looking for normal results and some of you are gonna write me off, but some of you are gonna be like, hey, that's pretty wise. Let's, let, let's try that, so here we go. Some lines of margin that I would suggest. The first one, if you're taking notes, is I would encourage you to dress for spiritual success. Dress for spiritual success. And this is as anti-cultural as it gets. But when you dress, what if you dressed in such a way as to bring glory to God and not draw attention to your assets? Dressing for spiritual success. The second thing, if you're taking notes, what if we kept four feet on the floor when we're dating? Uh, keep four feet on the floor. And it's amazing how safe you can be when you're dating if you keep four feet on the floor. So don't be doing your Bible reading time together with your boyfriend or your girlfriend on your bed. Right? That's just not going to go well. Don't, don't be <laughs> wrapping your legs around each other while you're trying to do a Bible study or, or you're watching a movie. Because if, if you don't keep four on the floor, here's what happens. Uh, guys sit in there and girl uh, takes her nice smooth shaved legs and throws them up on his hairy legs and hairy legs meet shaved legs and boom, right? That's just clothes start flying off. That's just how that works. Uh, so four on the floor. I'm just going to suggest that. Next thing if you're taking notes is no sleepovers or plain house. And this is so normal in our day and time. No sleepovers or playing house. Like it gets late, and look, I've got a toothbrush and an extra bathroom, or extra toothbrush in the bathroom, and, and you can wear my T-shirt, and don't go home, let's just cuddle. And, and next thing you know, clothes are flying off. Another suggestion, and, and again, admittedly, this is extreme, but you're, you're dating, and we, we need extreme results. But I would suggest no canoodling. No canoodling, uh, no tongue wrestling, no tongue hockey, uh, tonsil hockey, uh, no making out. And uh, I I'm serious about this. Uh, this isn't thus saith the Lord. This is Josh suggesteth uh, it, it to thee. Um, there are a whole lot of lines between, hey, this is Sally and my name's Sally and clothes flying off and where we draw the line is gonna protect us or it's not. So I would just suggest no canoodling. And uh, you, it'll be amazing how much margin you have. Allison and I, uh, we waited until we were married to share in the gift of lovemaking. But we were, we were never tempted until we kissed. And when we kissed, temptation rose. Uh, you know, after a good kiss, I'd have to spend the rest of the day fighting Allison off of me. Just, just trying to keep her at bay. And that's, that's really not true. Like, as soon as I said that, I knew the Holy Spirit was gonna convict me. Um, but no canoodling, okay? And I, and I realize it's extreme, but we want different results, and so we're gonna do different things. Another thing I would suggest is avoiding dangerous places. Avoiding dangerous places, and only you know what those dangerous places are to you. For you, it might be that you need to stay away from the bar after work. It might be that you need to stay out of the clubs. Avoid the dangerous places. It could be that you need to stay out of the chat rooms or, or stay out of the, the, the library. I don't know. Stay out of that, that aisle on the, on the grocery store. Stay out of the gym. Maybe you can't handle those visual temptations. You know where your place is. Avoid it. Another thing, uh, restricting Internet activity. And I just want to pause here for a second and say that when I was a kid, to come across a, pornogra a pornographic image, it was difficult. And it, was, it definitely wasn't easy, right? 
uh, today, it's as simple as a swipe. It's as simple as a click. It's as simple as just being at the wrong place at the wrong time. And so you have to create margin to protect you. And to the parents, if you are so naive as to give your kids an internet connected phone, which I do not advise, you should take responsibility in creating margin to protect them. Limit the access, limit the apps, the times of activity, activate the parental controls, and you should check their phones regularly. Because you have an enemy, we have an enemy who is out to get us, he's out to ensnare us, to entrap us, and we don't want our kids to one day say, I never thought it would happen to me. The cost is high. Another suggestion I have is to avoid time alone with the wrong people. Whoever wrong people is for you, stay away from those intimate situations. And I know in the business world, it's very common for a company to send, you know, two people off for an overnight place in some city. You talk about dangerous, you talk about putting rounds in the revolver. Is it okay? Sure. Is it legal? Sure. Is it wise? Heck no. There's nothing wise about it at all. And I would even suggest avoiding intimate conversations or inappropriate conversations uh, with people that you travel with. Avoid time alone with the wrong people. And then finally, this is very practical, guard your eyes, guard your heart, and guard your mind. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little eyes, what you read. If you're reading romance novels or, or reading magazines that maybe aren't really bad, but they arouse in you something that isn't holy, something that isn't God-honoring, guard your eyes. Guard your heart. Watch what you watch on Netflix, the movies, TikTok, Reels. Guard the conversation that you have. And pay attention to your imaginations and to your fantasies. The Bible says to take every thought captive and make them obedient to Christ. We're given Job's example where he makes a promise, a covenant with his eyes, not to look lustfully upon a woman. So I challenge us, guard your eyes, guard your mind and your heart. And you may think, Josh, this is so extreme. Yes, admittedly, it's extreme. The Bible says to flee sexual immorality. Nowhere else in the Bible are we told to get out while you still can. Run, Forrest, run. Yeah, you, you saw that coming, didn't you? <laughs> and I, I've never heard anybody say, you know where it all started for me was when I started creating margin in my life. It always starts with people just crossing line after line that they never set up as a barrier. So may we never settle for what the world settles for. May we be wise enough to step back and say, God, I'm going to honor you. I'm going to please you. I'm going to put you first. I'm going to make decisions that create moral margin. And may it forever bless our families. May your next generation be closer to God and walk in with less scars and less hurt than you did because you established moral margin. Would you pray with me, church? Father, I ask in this moment that your Holy Spirit would work in people's lives in the way that only you can. There's so much pain and guilt around topics like this. And God, I know even right now there are some that are dying on the inside with what's going on in their lives. And I pray that you would minister to us in a way that only you can. As we continue in prayer, I want to ask a couple of questions. The first one is this, how many of you would say that you probably do not have moral margin like you should? Like, like you just go through life like everybody else and you realize that there, there are probably some safeguards that would be wise to put in your life. If, that, if that's you right now, I just do not have moral margin. Would you be honest enough to just lift up your hand? I need moral margin. And God, I pray that everyone who realizes that there's some things that we could do to be even wiser, I pray that they would talk it over. That they would talk with their city groups, that they would talk with their spouses and in their families, in their homes, 
that they would bring this up, that they would create margin. I pray for the parents that they would gather with their children and spiritually nurture them by talking over some of these principles. And God, not avoiding the real issues of this life, but having the courage to talk plainly about them, we ask for wisdom to create margin, to put distance between us and temptation. And God, I pray that you would speak in the lives of those right now that have actually crossed some lines and are maybe looking at some things that are inappropriate or thinking some things that are wrong or acting out physically in ways that are hurting your heart, potentially destroying the things that they care about most. God, I pray in this moment that your Holy Spirit would convict them and that they would desire true freedom. God, I ask that they would have the courage to not only confess to you, but to confess to those around them. That they would cry out in humble confession and find mercy, find mercy in their time of need. God, I pray that they could not continue in their sinfulness, but you would pursue them with a grace and a love and a mercy they can't possibly begin to understand. Give us the courage to reach out for help, Jesus. Set people free. As you continue to pray today, some of you may be thinking, oh, there's just more than a hint of this in my life. There's way too much, and I feel serious conviction. Here's what I want you to think about. Those of you that are believers, the Holy Spirit is dwelling inside of you. And some of you would say, you know what? When I look at my life, when I look not just sexual sin, but all of it, I think, man, I've just been way too bad for God. How could God ever love someone like me? And here's what you've got to understand. God is crazy about you. You're the one that he came for. You're the reason that he sent Jesus. And you may say, but I'm so lost. It's so dark and my life is so messed up. You are exactly who he came for. And I thank him all the time that he saved me when I cried out to him. And no, my life wasn't immediately fixed, but immediately I was transformed spiritually. There are those of you here today, you are very aware right now of your sin. You're aware that it is separating you from God. You're aware that you're not everything that God would have you to be. Well, a great first step is just realizing it. You're there, you recognize it. And if you acknowledge your sinfulness, you acknowledge your need for a savior, you're at the right place. He's reaching out to you, he's offering salvation today. If you need his forgiveness, if you need to be transformed, you're just one prayer away. For those of you who say, yes, that's my heart. I need his forgiveness, I need his grace. I need to be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. If you'd like to give your life to Christ today, I wanna to invite you to just raise your hand on the count of three and I'm gonna pray with you. One, I'm giving my life to Christ. Two, I need his forgiveness. Three, I'm all in Jesus. Let's pray together, no one prays alone. Heavenly Father, I'm a sinner. I need a savior. Jesus, save me, change me transform me and make me new. I believe that you died for me so that I could live for you. I thank you for the new life I have in you. Now you have mine. In Jesus' name I pray. What all the church says, amen, amen. Hey, would you stand with me to your feet? And before we sing our next song, I just wanna say that this is the type of thing where we need to be a praying church. And we're opening up this, 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 through it out this whole series. We've said, let's create a space for prayer. So if you're one of our prayer leaders, I welcome you to come down to either side. And if you would like to pray with someone specifically about creating margin in your life, our prayer leaders are available. So please feel free to come down and pray. In the meantime, let's all sing together.